Hi there, microbiology students. I am Lady May Micabalo, and I will be your instructor for today. For today, we will talk all about antibiotic resistance in the 21st century. So at the end of this topic, you'll be able to explain and explore the basic mechanisms of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance, assess the importance of antibiotics and the consequences of emerging resistance, engage in activities that are needed to meet the threat of antibiotic resistance, and to reflect on major challenges that are related to resistance in the clinical practice and innovation in the 21st century. So, let us start by defining what is antibiotic. Antibiotic is any substance that inhibits the growth and replication of a bacterium or kills it outright. Antibiotics are a type of antimicrobial that are designed to target bacterial infections within or on the body. This makes antibiotics different from other main kinds of antimicrobials that are widely used today, such as antiseptics and disinfectants. Of course, bacteria are not the only microbes that can be harmful to us. There are fungi and viruses that can also be a danger to humans, and they are targeted by antifungals and antivirals, respectively. Only the substances that target bacteria are called antibiotics. While the name antimicrobial is an umbrella term for anything that inhibits or kills microbial cells, including antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, and chemicals such as antiseptics. Okay, so let's define some key terms. So we have known that antibiotic is a class of drugs that is used to treat bacterial infections. Antibacterial is used to be a synonym for antibiotics, in which today these are substances that are used to disinfect non-living surfaces that are known as antibacterial. So antifungals are a class of drugs that are used to treat fungal infections. Antivirals are a class of drugs that is used to treat viral infections. While the antimicrobial is a general term or the umbrella term for antibiotics in antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral substances. So how are antibiotics prepared? Antibiotic preparations come in many different forms depending on where the infection they are targeting is located. Creams or ointments may be applied to the infections on the outside of the body, while pills or liquids are used for most infections inside the body. Here, the antibiotics that we're going to discuss are absorbed into the bloodstream or target bacteria in the digestive tract Injections of antibiotic directly into the bloodstream, which are called intravenous antibiotics, are only used for the most serious infections. Okay, so let's tackle the history of antibiotics, the discoveries, and some legacies of scientists. So antibiotics have been used for millennia to treat infections. Although until the last century or so, people did not know that the infections were caused by bacteria. Virus molds and plant extracts were used to treat infections by some of the earliest civilizations. The ancient Egyptians, for example, applied moldy bread to infected wounds. Nevertheless, until the 21st century, um, infections that we now consider straightforward to treat, such as pneumonia and diarrhea that are caused by bacteria, were the number one cause of the human death in the developed world. It wasn't until the late 19th century that scientists began to observe antibacterial chemicals in actions. We have Paul Ehrlich, yes, that's Paul Ehrlich, who is a German physician, noted that certain chemical dyes colored some bacterial cells, but not others. He concluded that according to this principle, it must be possible to create substances that can kill a certain bacteria selectively without harming the other cells. So in 1909, he discovered that a chemical called arsifenamine was an effective treatment for syphilis. This became the first modern antibiotic, although Ehrlich himself referred to his discovery as chemotherapy. So the word antibiotics was first used over the 30 years later by a Ukrainian American inventor and microbiologist named as Salman Waxman, who in his lifetime discovered over 20 antibiotics. So here goes uh, Alexander Fleming, who was a messy man by nature who accidentally discovered penicillin. 
Upon returning from a holiday in Suffolk in 1929, he noticed that a fungus named as Penicillum nutatum had contaminated a culture plate of Staphylococcus bacteria he had accidentally left uncovered. The fungus had created bacteria-free zones wherever it grew in the plate. Fleming isolated and grew the mold in pure culture. So after early trials in treating human wounds, collaboration with British pharmaceutical companies ensured that the mass production of penicillin was possible. So there was a fire in Boston, Massachusetts, in which 500 people nearly died. Many survivors that received skin grafts, which are liable to infections by Staphylococcus. So this treatment with penicillin was hugely successful and the government began supporting the mass production of the drug. So let's discuss the importance of antibiotics. Why are antibiotics important today? So the introduction of antibiotics into medicine revolutionized the way infectious diseases were treated. Between 1945 and 1972, the average human life expectancy jumped by eight years with antibiotics used to treat infections that were previously likely to kill patients. Today, antibiotics are one of the most classes of drugs that is used in medicine and makes possible many of the complex surgeries that have become routine around the world. Antibiotics are sometimes used in a limited number of patients before surgery to ensure that patients do not contract any infections from bacteria entering open cocks. Without this precaution, the risk of blood poisoning would become much higher and many of the more complex surgeries doctors now perform may not be possible. So do you know in 1950s and 1960s, new drugs were being isolated all the time. However, the rate of drug discovery has slowed markedly. This lack of effective new antibiotics means the drug previously set aside as reserve antibiotic meant to be used only when no other treatment is available are being used more and more regularly and resistance is developing to them. Some of these reserve antibiotics are also more toxic or have severe side effects that more standard minor surgeries such as appendectomies could become life-threatening as they were before antibiotics became widely available. So let's discuss how do antibiotic works. So antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections. We have known that. Some are highly specialized and are only effective against certain bacteria. Other known as broad spectrum antibiotics attack a wide range of bacteria, including ones that are beneficial to us. So that's very harmful. So there are two main ways in which antibiotics target bacteria. We have bacteriostatic and bactericidal. So what's the difference between the two? When we say bacteriostatic, the antibiotic prevents the growth of the bacteria. However, bactericidal, the antibiotic ultimately kills the bacteria, not leaving anyone in the body. So they either, for example, stop the mechanism responsible for building their cell walls. That's why they're called bactericidal and they can kill the bacteria ultimately. Okay, so let's discuss how does antibiotic resistance develop. So we have all known that bacteria are quick to develop resistance to antibiotics. This can occur through spontaneous mutations. And these mutations are a result of mistake when bacteria copy their DNA as they divide. These mutations allow the bacteria to survive where others do not. And to reduce antibiotic resistance, it is important that patients finish a course of antibiotics once they have started it. This is the only way to ensure that as many bacteria as possible that are causing the infections are wiped out so that no one are left to start a resistant bacterial population. So sometimes in this mechanism, when antibiotics wipe out bacteria in our body, they can wipe out the susceptible ones. So the resistant ones survive and they can pass on the resistance to the susceptible bacteria. So here are some examples of methods of antibiotic resistance. How can a bacteria become resistant into these antibiotics? Example of this antibiotic is the cholamphenicol. 
the bacteria can have reduced uptake into the cell. We have tetracycline, in which the bacteria creates an active efflux from the cell. This efflux is kind of a pump that could inhibit the entry of the antibiotics into the body. We have also the beta-lactams, the erythromycin and the lincomycin, which the bacteria eliminates or reduce the binding of this antibiotic to the cell target. So another examples of antibiotics are sulfonamides and trimethoprim, in which the bacteria can become resistant to by metabolic bypass of inhibited reaction, overproduction of antibiotic target. Another examples are beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, and chloramphenicol. The bacteria can become resistant to these antibiotics to creating an enzymic cleavage, or they can modify them to inactivate the antibiotic molecule. How does resistance get passed on? So let's deal with the science behind the antibiotic resistance. And we have known that this antibiotic resistance is encoded in the DNA of the bacteria on one or more genes. For example, a gene may control whether the bacterium can produce a chemical that can destroy antibiotic molecules. So the bacteria has this, what we call as plasmid and these plasmids are circular chunks of bacterial DNA that can exist naturally inside many bacterial cells that may contain genes that confer antibiotic resistance. And take note that these plasmids are different from chromosomes. Bacteria has these plasmids that are just small chunks of bacterial DNA. So in order for the bacteria to pass on the resistance to other, they must exchange their genes. And here are some of the basic gene exchange mechanism that the bacteria undergo. The first one is conjugation. So this occurs when two bacteria are near to each other. And when they are near to each other, genetic material can be passed on directly between cells or via a hollow structure called a pilus, or a pore, that can form between two cells. Plasmids can use this pilus, like a bridge, to sending copies of themselves from one cell to another. DNA sequences that can move from one location on a genome to another can pass through the pore from one cell to another. And this process is what they call as conjugation. So let's take a look on this video on how conjugation is being undergone by bacteria. So some bacteria have a sex palace and we call these bacteria F positive and other bacteria don't have these sex palates and we call this F negative. Keep in mind that the sex palace is encoded by the bacterial plasmid not the bacterial chromosome. So the F positive bacteria will link with the F negative bacteria and form the mating bridge. Then the F positive bacteria will make a copy of its plasmid which encodes for the bacterial sex palace and will transfer this copy to the other bacteria. So now both bacteria have a plasmid which encodes for a sex palace and both are called F positive. This is the process of conjugation. So that's it for the conjugation process. So we have also another gene mechanism we have called transformation. And transformation of genetic material occurs when the bacterium dies, at which point it breaks up and releases its DNA into its environment. And the nearby bacteria can pick up this free-floating DNA and integrate them into their own genomes creating a potential pathway for antibiotic resistance dissemination. So again, let's take a look on this video. Transformation, which is also known as competence, is the ability of the bacteria to take naked genomes or naked DNA from the environment and use this DNA. So for example, if we have some medium with some bacteria in it, and we put some raw naked DNA, which encodes for antibiotic resistance into this medium as well, this bacteria will be able to take this DNA from the environment and use it, and it will become antibiotic resistance. However, if we add a DNA lysing agent into the environment, it will degrade the DNA and the bacteria will not be able to use it. 
We see this exclusively in Streptococcus pneumonia, Hedge influenza, and in Syria. So remember, transformation for fresh DNA. That was for transformation. Let us go on to our last basic gene exchange mechanism, and that is transduction. So transduction occurs when the virus attacks a bacterium and takes over the cell to make copies of itself. Sometimes bits of bacterial DNA are included in the DNA of the virus particles produced. The viruses then carry these chunks of bacterial DNA to other bacteria that they infect. Finally, transduction refers to the process where a bacteriophage, which is a bacterial virus carrying its own DNA, will inject this DNA into the bacteria. This viral DNA will be integrated into the bacterial DNA and will start replicating the virus. If this results in a bacterial death, we call this a lytic phage. And if it didn't, we call this a lysogenic phage. If the bacteriophage did not kill the bacteria, aka a lysogenic phage, it will give the bacteria some superpowers. So the bacteria now can produce exotoxins. So that was transduction. So again, what are the three basic gene exchange mechanisms? We have conjugation, transformation, and transduction. So I hope that was understandable. So let us discuss how people propagate antibiotic resistance. So the resistance to antibiotic is clearly as natural as antibiotics themselves, and therefore has been around for far longer than our knowledge of existence. Recognizing this, Alexander Fleming, the founder of penicillin, the very first uh, proven antibiotic, summarized the dangers of rising levels of antibiotic resistance in his novel Price Acceptance Speech in 1945. He said, the time may come when penicillin can be brought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant may, may easily underdose himself and may expose his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, making them resistant. Here is a hypothetical illustration. We have Mr. X has a sore throat. He buys some penicillin and gives himself not enough to kill the bacteria, but enough to educate them to resist penicillin. He then infects his wife. Mrs. X gets pneumonia and is treated with penicillin. As the bacteria are now resistant to penicillin, the treatment fails. Mrs. X dies. Who is primarily responsible for Mrs. X death? So indeed, following the introduction of most antibiotics, resistant strains of bacteria tended to arise sooner rather than later. In fact, resistance to penicillin, the very first widely used antibiotic, was reported before the drug even became available to the civilians in 1945. Ever since then, there has been an evolutionary arm race between researchers developing new drugs and bacteria becoming resistant to them. Then why is it then that antibiotic resistance seems to have suddenly become a pressing concern for healthcare providers and scientists around the world? Here are some ways on how people can propagate antibiotic resistance. So to an extent, and Alexander Fleming's prediction of incorrect antibiotic usage has come true. Many countries, prescription and use of antibiotics is not controlled very strictly, if at all, allowing resistance to develop more quickly. Doctors may prescribe antibiotics for many reasons, for example, patient pressure, even if when they are not needed. Antibiotics are often prescribed to treat the common cold which is a viral disease, and against which antibiotics are completely useless. Alternatively, poor diagnostic methods can mean that infections are not recognized correctly and broad-spectrum antibiotics are prescribed just in case. So another reason are places such as care home and hospitals where people are vulnerable to infections, live together in a small area, are hotbeds for antibiotic resistance. The overuse of antibiotics in the hospitals in such environments 
coupled with the concentration of the vulnerable people, creates an ideal breeding ground for a resistant bacteria. Another reason is antibiotics are increasingly used in livestock and fish farming. The amount of some antibiotics used in agriculture has increased nearly told in the last 50 years. Resistance in animals is widespread as a result, and it is easily transmitted to humans through the meat that we consume, and it also enters the rivers and the sea through runoff from the fields. So it's very dangerous. Another reason is the availability of the international and global travel. This means that resistant strains of bacteria can spread globally, quickly, and easily. It is important that to remember that antibiotics don't cause resistance. Much rather, they create an environment which selects for resistant strains, as these have a large advantage over strains susceptible to antibiotics. Again, I repeat, antibiotics don't cause resistance. It is the bacteria that becomes resistant to the antibiotics. So as microbiology students, we will have to tackle some case studies that involves resistant bacteria. We have only two examples, so it will be easy for you. We have this XDRTB, the extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. So we have known that tuberculosis is second only to HIV in terms of the number of people that die from the infections. The bacteria that causes the TB, do you know that? That is the mycobacterium tuberculosis that attacks the lungs and it's spread through the air by coughing and sneezing. So this XDRTB describes TB caused by a strain of bacteria that is resistant not only to all main antibiotics that is used against TB, but also to half of all the alternative drugs that is used if the main ones fail. This means that the XDRTB does not respond to standard six-month treatment regimen with antibiotics that is used against normal TB. Instead, the treatment can take up to two years and involve drugs that are more toxic, less effective, and far more expensive. So the XDRTB is present in all the continents with confirmed cases having arisen in 58 countries as of 2010, and over half of them is in Europe. What's more is the cases of the totally drug-resistant TB or the TDRTB have been reported from India. And such bacteria are resistant to all the first and second line antibiotics that is currently used against tuberculosis. Next resistant bacteria that we will have to focus on is the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So methicillin is an antibiotic. And this is widely used to treat Staphylococcus aureus bacterial infections after its introduction in year 1959. However, just two years after the dimethicillin discovery was uh, conducted, uh, resistance strains emerge. And today, methicillin in its original form has been rendered all but obsolete and the medicine resistant Staphylococcus aureus or the MRSA has become a catch all term for Staphylococcus aureus that is resistant to all the newer antibiotics that have been used to treat infection. So there are been measures that are done in the healthcare settings to prevent the spread of MRSA. Basic hygiene measures such as hand washing and avoiding moving patients around too often can be enough to prevent the spread of MRSA. Okay, so we're down to our last topic, and that is on the measures to slow the antibiotic resistance. This includes the antibiotic stewardship and the promising alternatives that are currently discovered. So always remember that antibiotic resistance develops naturally. It often evolves spontaneously and can play a role in competition between microbial species. And as a result, 
we cannot stop it completely. Much rather, the aim is to slow its advance to ensure that antibiotics remain useful and effective for as long as possible. There are several aspects to this challenge, which, which are summarized under the umbrella term antibiotic stewardship. The first aspect of the antibiotic stewardship is to prevent infections that require antibiotic treatment from developing in the first place. For example, through having a good hygiene. This requires reducing the spread of the bacterial infections, which means that antibiotics aren't needed. And if you don't expose bacteria to antibiotics, the rate that resistance evolves is much slower. The second challenge becomes relevant at once an infection has occurred or it, when it becomes essential to use antibiotics, such as prior to major surgery. At this point, it is crucial to use antibiotics in a targeted way and only when they are really needed. Specific antibiotics are better than broad spectrum ones because they can only affect certain species of bacteria rather than interacting with many different ones, including the beneficial bacteria. This ensures that as many antibiotics as possible remains useful and effective for a longer period of time. It is also important to begin monitoring antibiotic prescription patterns and the occurrence of the resistant bacterial strains and in order for us to hope to better understand what makes patients more likely to acquire antibiotic resistant infections. Finally, is developing better diagnostic methods for diseases and infections. This is another important way of slowing the spread of antibiotics because as doctors need to wait for the analysis of samples before they even know what microbes they are dealing with, there is the pressure on the doctors, the general practitioners, and the hospital-based doctors to prescribe broad-spectrum antibiotics. The more quickly doctors know what exactly causes the infection, the more able they are to prescribe effective targeted treatments. So the question is, if the bacteria are developing resistance to existing antibiotics, then why do we not just discover or create new antibiotics? There are several problems with this approach. First, many bacterial species now have extensively drug-resistant or even pan-drug-resistant strains that are resistant to most or all known antibiotics that were previously susceptible to. These strains are causing considerable difficulties in hospitals and the cost of treating them is far higher than for non-resistant strains. The development of antibiotics has slowed markedly in the 21st century. From 2008 to 2012, just four new antibiotics were approved for the U.S. market, compared with 16 during those 1980s and 1990s. In fact, no new antibiotics have been discovered for a class of bacteria called gram-negative bacteria. And this is due to a mixture, of course, of scientific, economic, and regulatory reason. So let's discuss these reasons first. The first reason for not developing new antibiotics is the scientific reasons. More commonly found antibiotics have mostly been discovered already. They tend to crop up repeatedly when researchers are screening for drugs, while new drugs are proving increasingly elusive. In addition, some potential new antibiotics cannot be used, for example, due to their toxicity. Next reason is the economic reasons. This evolves for the producers on the companies that produces antibiotics. Antibiotics are generally prescribed for a short period of time. This makes them much less profitable than drugs that the patient has to take for the rest of their life. So pharmaceutical companies have less of an incentive to invest millions into antibiotic research. Next reason is the regulatory causes. The hurdles that the antibiotics have to clear to be licensed for human use have been getting higher. This means that 
companies have to invest more money before seeing any return at all. And the risk of drugs not being approved is higher. So scientists have speculated what we could do if worse comes to worse and we had to make do without any antibiotics. Researchers are exploring other possibilities of having alternatives to antibiotics. The first one is the bacteriophages and phage therapy. The second is the antivirulence drugs. And the third one is the bacteriosins. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. Their name translate as bacteria eaters. Until recently, they received little attention from the doctors because widely available and effective antibiotics were much easier to use. Okay, so one advantage of bacteriophages over antibiotics is their availability. Thought to be the most abundant organisms on Earth, they are so diverse that no two identical phages are found. This means that the bacterial host and the phage co-evolve, so when the bacteria become resistant to a phage, the phage will often evolve to reinfect it. Because of this, the phage are described to be bacteria-specific. Next alternative is the antivirulence drug. Traditional antibiotics inhibit the growth of bacteria or kill them outright. Another class of drugs called antivirulence drugs instead disables the specific proteins that the bacterium uses to attach to our cells, preventing it from establishing an infection. Because antivirulence drugs disarms rather than kill the bacteria, they may not drive development of antibiotic resistance because susceptible organisms can still pass on their genetic material. Resistance is not selected for. A study of antivirulence drugs has shown that drug resistance bacterial strain will not come to dominate susceptible ones. This means that this antivirulence drug is effective. And the last alternative is the bactericins. These are proteins that are produced by bacteria that are toxic to similar or closely related bacteria. Essentially, they are narrow-spectrum antibiotics that bacteria produce to eliminate competitors. Bactericins attack pathogens that are produced by bacteria that are harmless to us. So that would make an ideal antibiotics. And that's it, microbiology students. Thank you so much for watching and for listening. I hope you have learned something today. And for any questions, you may raise them in the comment sections or in the stream in order for me to check out and answer them one by one. Thank you so much.